lunchtime if you're this meeting is being recorded <laughs> and i was about to say until you got the the notice um this meeting is being recorded so um i hope you don't mind um and the idea would be that we can put the meeting up the webinar up once you can i all ask Maybe. everyone to mute themselves sorry i'm just gonna can I can I ask everyone to mute themselves, please? Yeah, thanks. And and so, so let the, when I said today, welcome to today's uh, webinar from of Intotox, the specialty section of Eurotox. It is recorded so that you can put it on, um, uh, that you can watch it again uh, on the Eurotox website. Um, well, and today is a very special day. Uh, so it, it is my pleasure, in fact, to introduce our, our chair of the specialty section, Professor Matthew Finken. Um, and he, he will uh, deliver today's webinar on liver-based in vitro models, and I'm pretty sure that's why most of you are here. It's a fascinating subject uh, where there's a lot to cover. Mathieu Finken is a, a full professor affiliated with the Free University of Brussels in Belgium, and he's also a visiting professor at the University of Sao Paulo in Brazil. And he has a background in pharmaceutical sciences and specifically in vitro toxicology. He's a European registered toxicology and the past president of the European Society of Toxicology in vitro or ESTIV, who will have a conference later on this year. And his uh, research focus is situated in the field of mechanistic and in vitro modeling of liver, liver toxicity specifically. And that's why we asked him to, uh, to, give this, uh, to give you this webinar. He's also an editor of a couple of uh, toxicology journals and published more than 200 papers. He's coordinated a number of European projects, among which is the Ontox project that uh, quite a number of us are involved in, which intends to set up animal-free approaches for predicting chronic toxicity induced by chemical uh, compounds, specifically also chemicals that uh, are associated with liver toxicity. And as I've said before, uh, for today's webinar, Mathieu will focus on liver-based in vitro models uh, to be used for pharmaceutical, uh, pharmacological and toxicological testing purposes. And um, the uh, webinar will be recorded. What we ask you to do is that you um, put your questions in the chat and then we can cover them after uh, his uh, around 30 minute, uh, 30 minute presentation. And please feel free then to, to speak up. And in the meanwhile, enjoy, uh, enjoy the lecture. Um, and then for you, Mathieu, thank you so much for, for joining and thank you for giving us this presentation. Um, and I will now upload your, um, upload your presentation so that you can watch us. Okay, thank you so much. And actually, it's, it's me having to thank you because it's uh, usually me introducing the speakers and sharing thank these you. kind of webinars. So uh, <laughs> it's nice for a change that somebody else does it. So thank you so much. So welcome, everybody. Um, indeed, today I will talk about liver based in vitro models. Um, we did have a couple of technical issues. I was not able to upload, at least not in presentation mode. Uh, presentation from my own computer. That's why Ninke kindly offered to do so from her computer. And I suppose that we are trying to pull up the presentation now. Yeah, yeah. so um, Elaine, can you make me presenter? <laughs> Thanks. Sorry, there is a technical issue. It worked perfectly yesterday. Elaine? <laughs> Could you please give me the rights? Ah, perfect. Thank you. Okay, here we go, guys. We 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 have it going. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and there we go. Yep, so now I will ask for control. Okay, let's see if this works. Yes, it does. All right, yes, it does. Thank you so much. So I assume that all of you can see my full screen now, at least I can. So please give me a shout, or if you don't see it, um, 
All right, so as already announced, so today I will talk about liver based in vitro <laughs> models, specifically sea bird. Uh, <laughs> okay. Wait. Sorry, this is, I should not touch it. My fault. Yeah, I think that's a good idea. Thank you. So, yeah, indeed, uh, today I will talk about these liver based in vitro models that can be used for toxicity testing, pharmaceutical testing, but by extension, you can, you know, you should consider this in a bit of a, a broader way. Uh, the liver based in vitro models that I will present to you today, in a nutshell at least, well, they are applicable for any kind of biomedical application, if you will. Now, before doing so, I think it is important that we sketch a little bit the context of all of this. And again, I will focus here today on the use of these liver based in vitro models for uh, toxicity testing. I think that you all know that before any chemical, any chemical compound can be placed onto the market, like the European market, that its safety towards man and his environment must be assessed. And in order to do so, this kind of a safety assessment or a toxicological dossier must be made. Now, this dossier contains, I would say, very obvious kind of, of data, like you know, the physical chemical properties of the, of the chemical. Um, if that is available, also epidemiological data, even clinical data. But more and more, we see like this QSAR data also popping up in this kind of dossier. So quantitative structure activity relationship. Now, the reality is that for, you know, retrieving all of this, of most of this information, I should say, that we still rely to, a, I would say, a big extent on animal experimentation, so in vivo experimentation. However, more and more, there is a tendency to also use alternative methods for that purpose. And that can be in silico information, so that's computational testing, but in particular in vitro information. And that is fully in line with the three R's concept that I'm pretty sure that most of you are familiar with this. So these three R's have been introduced already in 1959 by two UK scientists called Russell and Birch, and as such calls for refinement, replacement, and reduction of animal experimentation. And as you might know, this 3Rs concept forms the basis for a very important, at least in this context, a very important piece of European legislation about the protection of animals used for scientific purposes, which was introduced already in 1986, but that was kind of revamped, if you will, about 12 years ago. So that is the Directive 2010-63, as you might know. Now, another Again, at least in this context, relevant piece of European legislation is the legislation about cosmetics. So there is already since many years, very important uh, legislation on cosmetics. So the finalized or the final products, but also their ingredients that was first established in 1976. So then it was a directive, but you are probably aware of the fact that it has been very drastically changed several years ago, about 13 years ago, when it was turned into a regulation, which means that it becomes immediately valid in all of the European member states. And well, as we all know, according to this uh, regulation, we are no longer allowed in Europe to use animals for the safety testing of cosmetic products and their ingredients. So that's a testing ban. But there is also something called the marketing ban, uh, which let's say, prohibits bringing onto the European market uh, finalized cosmetic products, but even their ingredients that have been tested on animals outside of the European Union. And then a final piece of legislation, which is at least seemingly a bit in contrast to all of this, is the European uh, regulation called Registration, Evaluation, Authorization and Restriction of Chemicals, maybe better known as REACH. And as such, REACH demands the safety, the dotage dependent uh, safety assessment of several 10,000 of chemicals that already are on the market. So as you can imagine, in order to meet the requirements that are imposed by REACH, well, that several of 10,000 of animals actually would be required. But at the same time, REACH also tries to at least introduce and to propose the use of these three R alternative methods. So let's uh, switch gears now. Uh, let's stop about the boring part legislation. So let's talk about uh, the science again. So we will be talking in this presentation about liver-based in vitro models. And for those not familiar with the, the liver, so what you see here on this slide on the left-hand side above is what you would see if you would look through a microscope and you would have a look at liver tissue. 
you would see several ten thousands of this hexagonal structure, which is called the liver lobule, which has a diameter of about one to two micrometer, and in which cells are organized radially around the branches of the hepatic vein. And at each of its six corners, a liver lobule meets two other lobules, which is called the portal triad, and that is what is magnified on the left-hand side below. And as you can see, this portal triad, well, it consists of branches of the hepatic artery, the portal vein, and the bile duct. As is the case for all of the tissues and organs in our uh, organism, well, the liver also harbors several different cell types, which is demonstrated to you on the right-hand side below. So the most important liver cells are both in function, as we will see in a minute, but also in number are these brown cells, or at least brown in the figure here. So these are the parenchymal cells called the hepatocytes, which really can be considered as Let's call them the workhorses of the liver, if you will, because they do take care of most of the liver specific functions. And I will be coming back to this further on. But nevertheless, there are also some very important non parenchymal liver cell types present. And these are also shown to you. So, for example, these endothelial cells, these blue cells, at least in the figure of first blue cells, that make up the lining of the blood flow, which is called the stenozoid, uh, as you probably know. And by doing so, they also create the space of this. So this is very important because this is also where the extracellular matrix component, at least most of those will reside. And I will be coming to, back to this uh, further in the presentation. So please do keep this in mind. And finally, in the sinusoidal lumen, there are also some other very important, um, let's say non parenchymal cell types present like these cuprous cells and dendritic cells that have an immunological function. And I shouldn't forget of course about these stellate cells that actually reside in the space of uh, this and they have a very important physiological function. So what do they do? They actually store vitamin A, but you might know that in specific types of liver disease and toxicity, like in fibrosis, they adopt a very different phenotype. And I also will exemplify this further on. They lose their vitamin A content and they start to produce excessive amounts of extracellular matrix components. So, well, the liver is a vital organ, as you probably know, you cannot live without a liver. And indeed, the liver performs a number of very important vital functions. And as already alluded to on the previous slide, most of them are actually performed by the hepatocytes, uh, which as I call them, the work forces of the liver. So just a couple of important functions performed by the liver is it plays a central role, of course, in the metabolism of lipids, carbohydrates, um, but also in the synthesis and the secretion of essential proteins. Think about blood coagulation factors, albumin, for example. As already exemplified, the liver also starts a number of vitamins and nutrients, but from the toxicological and more specifically the pharmacotoxicological point of view, the most prominent liver function is of course the biotransformation of these foreign chemicals, which we collectively designate as xenobiotics. And as a consequence of this function, of course, the liver also uh, represents a primary target for systemic toxicity. And for this reason, it's not very surprising that uh, over the last four to five decades, a lot of attention has been paid and is still being paid to the development, but also the further optimization of liver-based in vitro models. And as a result of all of these efforts going around in different labs all over the world, there are two major groups of these liver-based in vitro models available today. And this is what is shown to you on this slide. So the first group are the liver-derived in vitro models. And as the name already suggests, they are directly derived from the liver and they can range from the whole isolated diffused liver to liver slices, isolated primary hepatocytes and their cultures, liver-derived cell lines, all up to subcellular fractions. And as we will see further in this presentation, they all differ in complexity and hence in longevity. The second group or the set, second class of the liver-based in vitro models that have been introduced more recently, so that is in the last two decades or so, are the stem cell derived in vitro models in which stem cells from different origin like embryonic stem cells, adult stem cells, tumoral stem cells, and reprogrammed somatic cells can be differentiated in vitro in what we call hepatocytal-like cells. We do not call them hepatocytes yet, 
of course, there's a lot of discussion around this, but I will be coming back to this in the presentation why we still prefer to call them hepatocyte like cells and not full blown hepatocytes. And actually, this defines uh, the contents of the remainder of this presentation. So, what I would like to do uh, is to give you an overview of each of these different models. So, how are they built up, their advantages, disadvantages? And as you will see, I will pay most of my attention to this first group, the liver derived in vitro models, for the very simple and pragmatic reason that these are the models that are still, at least at this point, being mostly used um, in regulatory settings and pharmaceutical settings and industrial settings in general, especially compared to the stem cell derived in vitro models. So let's get started. So we will be starting with the liver derived in vitro models. And the first model here is actually not a true in vitro model, it's what we tend to call an ex vivo model, namely the whole isolated diffused liver. So to set up this model, you need to first start from a freshly isolated liver that is then embedded in the kind of device that you can see here on the slide that kind of mimics, if you will, the blood flow. So the obvious advantage of this kind of ex vivo model is, if you will, is that you preserve the entire structure and the function as we discussed in one of the previous slides of the liver which makes it a very appropriate representation of the hepatic in vivo situation. Among the disadvantages is the fact that it's only suitable for small animals like rodents, for example, and that in general, an isolated liver, a whole isolated diffused liver has a short viability of only a couple of hours, but nevertheless, it can be used in pharmaceutical industry, for example, for short-term kinetic studies. The second example, so remember that we are still in the first group, the liver derived in vitro models. And the second example here is a true in vitro model is what we call the liver slice model. So here again, you need to start from a freshly isolated liver or at least freshly isolated liver tissue in which as you can appreciate from the images on the upper panel, well, that you first need to, you know, isolate a kind of a fragment with a kind of a corkscrew, if you will which is then further processed by means of the slicer using or yielding, I should say, slices of about 100 to 250 micrometer in thickness that are then uh, being incubated, as you can see from the panel uh, below, in uh, a typical cell culture dish in the presence of you know, any kind of cell culture medium. So here again is the advantage that you preserve, well, of course, not the entire liver structure, but at least the lobular structure and function. So remember this hexagonal structure. And as a consequence, again, that you have a kind of a good representation of the hepatic in vivo situation. Among the, well, let's call them disadvantages, is the fact that the setup of this kind of liver slice model, of course, requires high technical skills, as you probably already understood from the figures shown on this slide. And again, that the viability is pretty short, although somewhat better, if not to say quite better, compared to the whole isolated diffuse liver. So in the early days of the liver slices, you can only keep them alive for five to six hours. But if you look in literature today, there are already protocols in which you can keep them for a couple of days. And again, uh, this liver slice model is quite popular, especially in pharmaceutical industry. So for instance, if you want to elucidate the metabolite pattern of a candidate drug, so metabolite profiling, or if you want to shed new light on you know, the mechanism of action of be it a drug or a toxin. Okay, so the third example in still the first group of the liver derived in vitro models are what we call uh, the gold standard in vitro model. So this is, you know, what is, is seen as the most commonly used in vitro model in the field of liver based in vitro modeling, namely the use of primary hepatocytes and preferably human primary hepatocytes. Now they are typically isolated from freshly isolated liver using this two-step collagenous diffusion technique using the device, which is schematically shown to you on this slide. By the way, the figure that you see on the uh, left-hand side is a figure taken from our own lab, but I still used to do uh, some bench research uh, in the lab, uh, but this is demonstrated here with a rat liver. We don't do this anymore in our lab. We are now working with human hepatocytes, which by the way, we don't isolate ourselves. but this is still a common technique. So uh, to be isolated from, let's say, rodent uh, liver. And the technique that is 
still being used, and that has been introduced in the 70s, if I'm not mistaken, of the previous century, is a two-step collagenous perfusion technique. And as the name suggests, this consists of two steps, the first step being the perfusion of the freshly isolated liver with a calcium-free buffer. So the idea here is to abolish a cell-cell context. You probably still know from the cell biology course that a lot of cell-cell contacts, so think about these catarines and catenines, while they fully rely on the presence of calcium. So the idea is if you take away calcium, you basically also will mess up all of the cell-cell contacts. The second step is then to further perfuse the liver with collagenase, which is an enzyme that abolishes cell extracellular matrix complex. So I think you got the rational by now of this technique. So you want to break up all of the cellular complex. So in general, at least if you apply this, for example, to rat liver, well, this will yield between 200 and 300 million cells of which most are hepatocytes with a viability of at least 80%. And although this is a technique that is still being you know, abundantly used all over the world, the main disadvantage of this two-step collagenous perfusion technique is that it elicits a so-called de-differentiation process that is pursued upon further cultivation of the hepatocytes or after the isolation, and which is the very reason for which conventional cultures of freshly isolated primary hepatocytes, and by conventional, I mean just seated on a plastic culture dish, well, the reason that they cannot survive for more than two days, so to say, and this is really due to this de-differentiation. And actually what you see here on this slide is of course an oversimplified scheme of how this de-differentiation process looks like at the molecular level. So in the normal liver, of course, in vivo, uh, well, the cells are in intimate uh, contact with each other, of course, but because of this two steps collagenous perfusion technique, you mess up all of the cellular context. So you force the cells to re enter the cell cycle. And this is associated with the induction of both an inflammatory response, but also a cell growth response, which is, as you can see from this slide, mediated by NF kappa beta, which is a, a, a transcription factor, as you know, and then uh, uh, mitogen activated protein kinase, which is a cell growth mediator. I won't go into the details here, but what this actually does is that it, it uses a lot of transcriptional changes, all that, uh, you know, or at the expense of the functional differentiated status. So this is what we call B differentiation. And the unavoidable consequence of this is the onset of spontaneous cell death, mainly by apoptosis. And again, this all happens in one or two days after cell uh, isolation and cultivation. And that is again, the reason why you cannot keep these cultures for longer than two days. Of course, in course of time, uh, a lot of efforts have been focused on trying to reduce and counteract this de-differentiation process. Uh, with the idea of setting up primary hepatocyte cultures that can be used for longer testing purposes. So think about weeks or even months. And we do have quite some tricks available, if you will, to uh, achieve this. And they are mainly, if not uniquely, based on trying to mimic again or to reestablish the natural in vivo uh, microenvironment. So to fully understand what we call this anti-de-differentiation strategies, we need to have a look again to the natural microenvironment of the hepatocyte. So we already touched on this in one of the, uh, the first slides, but uh, I would like to uh, come back to this again. So in the natural environment of the hepatocytes, there are at least three factors that keep the hepatocytes in their fully functional and differentiated status. And this is what exemplified or demonstrated to you on the right-hand side. So first of all, as I already mentioned, we have all of these extracellular matrix components that mainly reside in the space of this, that give the three-dimensional configuration uh, to these hepatocytes, which in turn is indispensable for the hepatocytes to perform their functionality. So that's the first factor. The second factor are you know, hormones, metabolites, whatever kind of soluble mediators that are present in the blood, of course, that directly affect positively affect the functionality of the hepatocytes. That's the second factor. And then the third factor are direct contacts between neighboring hepatocytes or even indirect contacts between the hepatocytes and any of the non-parenchymal cells that also have an effect on hepatocyte functionality. Now, each of these three factors forms the basis for one of the three, what we call classical anti-de-differentiation strategies. So kind of strategy, to reestablish the in vivo microenvironment 
in an attempt to keep the cells functional for longer periods of time in culture. So our first classical anti-differentiation strat strategy is pretty straightforward. It's the addition of what we call differentiation promoting compounds to the cell culture medium. And these can be, of course, physiological factors like hormones, insulin, vitamins, like vitamin C, but also non-physiological factors. Think about phenobarbital, which is a drug that induces biotransformation capacity. But even things like DMSO, which is a solvent, but that has, at least in low concentrations, quite beneficial effects on hepatocytes. And of course, all of this can be done in a static culture system, what you see on the left-hand side above, so the monolayer, classical monolayer culture. And by the way, the microscopic picture that you can see here on this slide is a picture taken from our own lab already many, many years ago. So freshly isolated rat hepatocyte cultured for two days in a classical monolayer culture. But of course, you can make this a more dynamic system, if you will, like the perifusion culture system in which you have a continuous renewal of all of these uh, cell culture media, which is pretty expensive, by the way, but that, of course, much more reflects the in vivo situation. So that is the first trick, if you will, the first anti-differentiation strategy. The second one is to re-establish cell-cell uh, context, which, of course, will fully messed up during the two steps collagenous perfusion technique by seeding the cells, the hepatocytes, together with another cell type, so a co-culture, if you will. And the second cell type can have an hepatic origin, like red liver epithelial cells of any or any of the non-parenchymal cells, like heparous cells, or it also can be a non-hepatic kind of, of cell, like fibroblastic cell lines or stem cells or whatever. By the way, the microscopic picture that you see on this slide here that is a picture of uh, cultures of freshly isolated primary hepatocyte taken, if I'm not mistaken, at day seven of cultivation. And you see these white cells, which are the hepatocytes and the more black cells or these red liver epithelial cells. So you can already tell, you know, just by doing this co-culturing that the hepatocytes are in a much better shape than they would be if they would be cultivated alone. And here again, there's a kind of an alternative, uh, an improved alternative, that's a spirit culture. So you can do all of these co-culture, uh, you know, techniques in a three-dimensional configuration. So these spheroids that even better reflect, of course, in the situation. So that was the second classical anti-differentiation strategy. The third one is the re-establishment of cell extracellular matrix context, which can be achieved by seeding the cells, the freshly isolated hepatocytes, on a single layer of extracellular matrix components, or between two layers of extracellular matrix components, which produces what we call the sandwich culture system. So the scaffolds that you use, the extracellular matrix scaffolds, can be of different origin, like of natural origin, like physiological ones, like collagen, for example, also non-physiological ones. You might be familiar with matrigel, which is extracted from a mouse tumor. But also several labs all over the world have introduced synthetic scaffolds, like polymers and nanofiber matrices. And by the way, the picture that you see here, the microscopic picture, is a picture taken at day 14 already of cultivation of primary uh, you know, rat hepatocytes that have been cultured so for two weeks between two layers of this collagen one. So this is uh, a sandwich culture system, and you can really see that the cells still are in a good shape. Now, a more recently introduced alternative to this is the use of the decellularized liver. So here, and this is exemplified again by means of a rat liver, you will perfuse the freshly isolated liver by means of a detergent, and you will end up, it's pretty neat actually. So in one hour, you will end up with this liver, as you can see on the right-hand side below, which is fully transparent. So you got rid of all of the cells, but you still have the entire extracellular matrix backbone, including also growth factors. And as a matter of fact, this can be used then to be repopulated with stem cells, which I will uh, talk about in the second part of the presentation. Now, although promising results have been obtained by following these three, what we call classical anti-differentiation strategies or combinations of those, they have only been successful in part. And a reason for this is that they typically, you know, are focused on counteracting the consequences of the differentiation without acting on the true causes. Now, over the past few decades, especially with the advent of omics technologies, we now have a very good idea about the actual mechanisms, the causes of the differentiation. 
And we know that there are two main mechanisms involved here. So the first ones are the interaction of transcription factors with specific sequences and the promoters of the genes that are responsible for coding liver-specific proteins. Um, this is the classical cis-trans mechanisms, of course. And among these uh, transcription factors, as we will see further on, or for instance, the liver and retranscription factor. So that is the first mechanism. The second mechanism is epigenetic mechanism. So that is, let's say, changes in the chromatin structure, which in turn have an effect on transcriptional activity. And you probably all know that there are three main, let's say, determinants of the epigenome, namely DNA methylation, histone modifications, and microRNA species. So each of these two mechanisms forms the basis for what we call the new, the novel anti-differentiation strategies. And the first one, again, is pretty straightforward, is genetically altering primary hepatocyte culture. So the idea here is that during this two steps collagenous perfusion technique has already explained, well, there is a deterioration of the production of these liver and rich transcription factors. So you want to restore this balance. You want to increase the production of these transcription factors in vitro, in culture, and you can do this in many ways. So for example, by bringing them to stable over you know, expression, if you will, which is exemplified here by means of this transcription factor called HNF for alpha, hepatocyte nuclear factor for alpha. The second um, new anti-differentiation strategy is the epigenetic alteration of primary hepatocyte cultures. And actually that was the topic of my own PhD project already more than 20 years ago. So here again, the idea is that during hepatocyte isolation, so the two steps collagenous perfusion technique and the cultivation, well, you mess up the uh, epigenome, if you will. So you want to, you know, you want to restore this and you can do this by adding these epigenetic modifiers to the cell culture medium, like tricostatin A, TSA. So the idea is here is that you will open up the chromatin structure in order to make them, make it more accessible for transcription factors to bind and thus to produce liver specific proteins. Okay, that was a lot of attention being paid to primary hepatocytes, but I did this on purpose because, as I already mentioned before, this is still being considered the gold standard uh, kind of model, if you will. But we are still in the first group, namely in the liver derived in vitro models. And another example here are the liver derived cell lines. There are several possibilities here. So, for example, these uh, cancer derived cell lines, as you might know, like HEPG2. And uh, well, the maybe better known HIPRG cells. And then the second kind of liver derived cell lines are the cell lines that basically started off as being usual, common primary hepatocytes, but that have been genetically modified in such a way that they continuously grow, like the WBF344 at the liver epithelial cell. By the way, the microscopic picture that you see on this slide are HIPRG cells. And for those familiar with hepatocytes, well, I hope you agree with me if I would say that they pretty well resemble at least phenotypically uh, hepatocytes. The advantage, as you know, of cell lines in general is that you virtually have an unlimited cell supply and that they are very easy to use. So you don't have to every time isolate them again like you have to do for prime hepatocytes. Among the disadvantages, but this mainly holds for the liver derived ones, is that they have like, a, well, very frequently aberrant functionality specific for g 2 and sometimes all genetic instability, but nevertheless, they are very popular also in industry, so they can be used for toxicity studies and mechanistic studies. And then the final example in the liver derived in vitro model group are these subcellular fractions. And here again, there are different kinds of tools, if you will, like this S9 fraction, which can be obtained by centrifugating a liver homogenate at 9000 G, or maybe better known, the microsomes, which can be produced by spinning a liver homogenate at a much higher velocity, so this 100,000 G. Um, well, the advantage specifically holding for microsomes is that they are, are keep their functionality, especially phase one by transformation capacity, which again makes them very popular in pharmaceutical industry, and that they are very easy to find and to buy and to make yourself, actually, if you have the appropriate centrifuge in your lab. Disadvantages, well, I think you can already tell by just looking at this microscopic picture on this slide. This is actually a microsomal structure. Uh, and of course, this is very far away from this complex in vivo relevant uh, architecture of the liver that we discussed at the start of the presentation, making all of this already uh, also very limited in terms of in vivo relevance. 
But as I mentioned before, nevertheless, they are very popular in that industry. All right, so that was the first group of the liver-based in vitro models, so the liver-derived in vitro models. In the final part of the presentation, I would like to shortly touch upon this more recently introduced group of liver-based in vitro models, namely the stem cell-derived in vitro models. And before doing so, we need to go through uh, some basic features, some basic terminology pertaining to stem cell biology. So um, I assume that most of you know that stem cells are characterized by two features. So they all display a kind of an extent of cell renewal, which means that they have the capacity to undergo cell divisions in an undifferentiated state. And a second characteristic is that they also um, have a kind of plasticity or a potency, which means that they can differentiate into specialized cell types. And as a matter of fact, there are different possibilities and different scenarios, if you will, regarding the plasticity of these stem cells. So embryonic stem cells can be totipotent or pluripotent, which means that they can, you know, uh, generate into embryonic and extra embryonic cell types or each of the three germ uh, layer cell types, as is exemplified here on this slide. But then for the more adult stem cells, well, they can be multipotent, bipotent, or unipotent, which is more restricted in the sense that they can differentiate into a family of related cell types, two cell types, or even one cell type. Now, I think it was back in 2007, uh, a Japanese group was able for the very first time to induce the state of pluripotency in an adult cell. So not in an adult stem cell, but in a full adult, adult cell. And actually they received the Nobel prize for this. So really showing how important this uh, discovery was. So there's actually this induced pluripotent stem cell uh, technology, if you will, is schematically shown here on this slide. I don't have the time to go through it in details, but basically uh, it comes down to, let's say, rendering an adult cell, and this is exemplified here by an adult skin cell, into a kind of a naive state, if you will. You will make the cell a bit of stupid, if you will. So by transducing with pluripotency genes, which are exemplified here. So this will allow you then to, you know, create any kind of cell, if you will. And of course, this opens a lot of possibilities for regenerative, med regenerative medicine, but in particular also for in vitro toxicology. And this is why it is also very uh, important for you know, us as in vitro toxicologists. Now, there are many strategies to differentiate stem cells of any kind into what we call hepatocyte-like cells. And I already alluded to this, so why do we call this hepatocyte-like cell? Now, although a lot of claims are being made in literature, there is not any of these approaches that allow to, you know, uh, generate, let's say, cells that fully reflect the full repertoire of all of the in vivo relevant, you know, hepatocyte functions. And that is why we do not call them yet hepatocyte, but hepatocyte-like cells. I'm pretty sure that people will disagree with me, but this is just a reality. This is just how it is, because this is still a growing field, if you will. But as I mentioned, a lot of people are working on this and there are a lot of strategies to differentiate stem cells into hepatocyte-like cells. They are listed here. They may sound fairly, very uh, familiar to you because they're actually almost identical to what we have called the classical anti-differentiation strategies for primary hepatocytes. Again, I don't have the time to go through all of them in detail, but I would say a most commonly followed strategy here is the exposure of stem cells to cytokines, growth factors, vitamins, and corticosteroids. And there are two types of exposure, if you will. So either you can expose the stem cells to all of these factors at the same time, which is called a cocktail exposure technique, or you can expose them to a sequence of these factors, which is in line with in vivo liver development. And actually on this slide, you can see again, an oversimplified scheme of how in vivo liver development looks like. So you can see it starts with endodermal cells that gradually develop into full-blown adult hepatocytes on the right-hand side. And what you can also see is that this is associated with a specific need at specific time points for specific factors. Like very early on, you need a lot of FGF, so fibroblast growth factor. While further in the process, you have, uh, well, the cells actually need this group of steroids. And this also goes hand in hand with the, you know, uh, expression at specific time points of specific factors. Like for example, very early on, you have a lot of expression of alpha theta protein, while this full-blown hepatocytes are typified by a lot of, you know, uh, production of alpha 
Now, this basic knowledge has served as the, let's say, basis uh, for a protocol that is still being abundantly used all over the world to differentiate stem cells in what we call hepatocytal-like cells. And this is just an example of how such a protocol looks like. So it's not set in stone, it's just an example. But what they all have in common is that there are two main steps in these protocols. So there is the expansion step, which is based on the cell renewal potential of the stem cells. And then there is the differentiation step, which is, of course, fully relying on the plasticity of cells. So again, uh, you expose the cells typically to all of these factors in a specific sequence in line with in vivo liver development. And you can even combine this with an epigenetic strategy, like for example, this TSA, as you can see from this protocol, this epigenetic modifier. So I would like to give three examples of this. Um, so the first example is serotonin and primal progenitor cells that have been differentiated into hepatocytal-like cells. Uh, using both the sequential exposure technique, so where you expose according to in vivo liver development, or according to a cocktail exposure technique, where you expose to all of these factors at the same time. Again, because of time restrictions, I cannot go into all of the details, but typically all of these readouts or the evaluation of these protocols is based on, remember, the in vivo liver development scheme on a number of these factors that are being expressed at specific steps in this uh, procedure in the in vivo liver development. So for instance, the production of these liver and rich transcription factors by transformation enzymes. But the most convincing as a parameter as an in vitro toxicologist is always the inducibility of biotransformation enzymes. And what you can see here is that, surprise, surprise, uh, the best results were, of course, of course obtained uh, if you perform the sequential exposure technique as opposed to the cocktail one, because you simply follow nature. So it makes absolutely sense. And just to sh show that this is also applicable to other species, so human mesenchymal progenitor cells. So here, uh, the combination was done of the common ex sequential exposure technique and that combined with an epigenetic strategy. And here again, you could even obtain uh, better results. And then the final example is again, the rat cells. So here again, sequential, whether or not combined with an epigenetic strategy. And what is actually shown here is that not only all of these liver you know, specific factors are much better expressed if you combine sequential exposure together with an epigenetic strategy, but they also become expressed at earlier time points. And for instance, have a look here at this HNF3 beta, which is being uh, detected at day 18 of cultivation in the common sequential exposure technique, while you can already pick it up at day three if you combine this with an epigenetic strategy, while well, you can say, so what? But for those of you who work with cells, you know that this is pretty expensive business. So if you can actually reduce the cultivation time, you will also save a lot of money. Okay, to end up, I would like to very shortly bring up a number of recently introduced in vitro models. And basically what they do is to combine everything that you heard previously in this presentation. So for example, stem cell derived hepatocyte like cells that are cultured in a three-dimensional configuration in a co-culture. And well, this is becoming a very interdisciplinary kind of effort. So this is uh, typically being combined with very fancy bioengineering stuff. So you can, you know, plate the cells on this chip, as you can see on the uh, left-hand side, or in a true bioreactor, as you can see on the right-hand side. And uh, well, especially for the chip format, you can combine this with microfluidics. So in order to mimic the blood flow, and even if you want to use this for toxicity testing, you typically have this inbuilt sensor. So you can really follow all the functionality and toxicity parameters in real time. So some people even take it a step further. They create a, a body or even a human on a chip. And the rationale, of course, here is that the liver is not the only target uh, for toxic uh, compounds. Uh, basically, all of our organs can serve as a target for toxicity. So what you can do here is to combine stem cells, you know, differentiate it into that specific uh, cell type or the primary cells of each of these organs and combine them on a chip. And again, to be uh, also combined with microfluidics and inbuilt sensors. And this, ladies and gentlemen, is actually not uh, anymore what you see in movies. This is actually becoming reality. Is the bioprinted and 3D printed liver? Of course, all of this is now being fully, let's say, uh, investigated for medicinal and medical uh, kind of purposes.
But once this will be up and running, this opens a lot of perspective for uh, in vitro toxicology as well. Well, at the end of the presentation, I think it would be reasonable to state that today we have liver derived in vitro models that unfortunately most of them can only still be used for short term purposes. And as I explained during this presentation, the main reason for this is that they are still making use of what we call the classical anti differentiation strategy. So they counteract the consequences, but not the causes of the differentiation. But of course, if we want to use them for longer testing schemes, so for weeks, even months, well, then we have to really, let's say, focus on this causes of the differentiation, as I exemplified here with this epigenetic strategy. And then for the stem cell derived in vitro models, well, today we still have a lot of, you know, uh, variability in the protocols and the sources, yielding what we call hepatocytal-like cells, not always with the highest purity. As I mentioned, this is a growing field. We make a lot of progress. Uh, it's going very fast in the stem cell field. And I'm pretty sure in a couple of years, we will have fully standardized protocols, especially for hepatocyte-like cells, yielding, and I'm pretty sure I'm convinced of this, not only functional hepatocyte-like cells, but full-blown hepatocytes with a lot of purity. Now, all of this is, of course, very ambitious. We are not there yet. And an absolute requirement to achieve all of this and to be applied, let's say, in regulatory and industrial settings is that we still need to have a lot of basic science research, scientific research. And of course, being an academic, this is exactly what you want to hear because this opens a lot of perspectives for doctoral and postdoctoral research. So this is also an open invitation, of course, to people attending today to spend your career on helping to you know, advance all of this. So I would like to thank you very, very much. And uh, before we move into questions, hopefully there will be some questions. I would like to advertise already our next um, webinar. And here we will be switching roles. So I will be chairing and then Minka will give a very exciting webinar on next generation physiologically based finetting modeling which will be taking place the 25th of May. Well, the same procedure as for the other uh, Intutox webinars in the sense that registration will be open tomorrow or the day after. Uh, it's on a first come first serve basis. Of course. So please don't um, you know, postpone uh, registration. So with this, thank you so much. And I would be happy to uh, answer any question you might have. And I will be giving control back to you, Linke. Oh, great. Thank you so much. Um, and I'll stop sharing my screen. There we go. Thank you so much, uh, Mathieu, for this very clear overview. I, I really enjoyed uh, the, the, the opportunities, like you say, for particularly this uh, for the liver toxicology field. And what I would suggest to do now is that everyone uh, with questions, please throw them into the chat. Um, and then uh, and then go ahead, I'll, I'll read them for you if you don't dare to speak out yourself. Uh, if not, of course, I will uh, I'll gladly ask them. Is there a first question? Not yet, from what I understand. Well, I, I, I always do have questions. Uh, you. Um, so I, I really, what I really enjoyed is, is a clear overview of the different different types of models that you have. And you started off with the liver slices and you specific, specifically mentioned um, that the, um, that you had the, uh, that these liver slices have their structural lobule um, structure still in place. And that, you know, the next one would be your stem cells, but they both seem to have a pretty short lifetime. Well, in, in what cases would you use the, the, the slices as opposed to the hepatocytes? So when is that lobular structure and the type of toxicity test that we do now uh, really important? So uh, I'm not pretty sure if I fully get your question, but would, would the question be so for what specific applications you would use a liver slice model and for which ones you would use stem cells or in general? Oh, just in general. So like I, I think first hepatocyte, your primary hepatocytes and the, oh. and the, and the uh, slices. Um, it really depends on the application. Um, so, for example, as, as, as you know, we in uh, my team in Brussels, we have a specific interest in so-called polystatic liver damage, so which is due to bile acid accumulation. And there we know that the gold standard model is, well, primary hepatocytes, but even this HIPAA or G cells. Uh, 
So what we tend to advise, not only for testing cholestatic liver damage, but in general for liver-based in vitro modeling and using these uh, models for predicting toxicity, is try to combine two models. Why? Because they all have their disadvantages, as I explained during this presentation, and uh, they all have their strengths. So in order to somehow compensate for that, um, it would be good if you can use two models in parallel. But again, the model should be fit for purpose. So you cannot just randomly pick like a model if you want to test something. What is, again, generally considered as the gold standard is primary hepatocytes. Why is that? Is because purely on the genotype and purely on the functionality, they do reflect, you know, um, to the maximum feasible extent in vivo capacity. And that's the only reason. But that does not mean that primary hepatocytes are the, you know, let's say the only kind of in vitro model that should be used for all applications. For liver slices, for example, to come back to your question, if you look in literature, it's being used for very specific uh, kind of application, like for testing cholestasis, also steatosis, fat accumulation, and even for genotoxicity. I see a lot of reports on that. But apart from that, you don't see it typically for many other kinds of applications. So it really needs to be seen on a case-by-case -case basis. Yeah, no, that's a very, very fair answer. Thanks. Uh... Thank you, Mathieu. Then we also have a question uh, by Barbara Birk from BASF. Um, she, and, and it's an interesting question. Um, she asks, to, in, in your perspective, what is the most important, what are the most important steps um, in the stem cell based models to get regulatory acceptance? So she yeah. mentioned specifically given accordance might be not easy because it's such a complex differentiation process. Yeah, well, first to be um, to be clear here, I mean, there are many areas in which stem cells are, are already much more advanced than in the hepatocyte field, like the neurotoxicity, the cardio field. I mean, there there's no question about this, even it's starting to be accepted. Well, I'm thinking about the OECD um, case now for neurotoxicity testing, where we also have stem cell based models for hepatocytes. We are far from being there. So what would be needed is that we have a consensus of what would be the acceptance criteria. I'm an editor of, of a, a number of journals and uh, I need to be careful what I will be saying right now. So I see a lot of papers passing by and I'm sorry for the wording, there was a lot of crap being published or at least trying to be published also for stem cells. Why? Because people do use the parameters that suits them best. You know, so for example, it's very easy to show that something will be expressed at the messenger RNA level, but that does not mean that it is functional. Also, what do you use as a benchmark? Very frequently, if people use stem cells and they differentiate into hepatocyte-like cells, they use as a comparison HEPG2 cells, but these are liver cancer cells. And of course, I mean, if you compare with something that is suboptimal, it will not be very difficult to have like a better performance. So to answer Barbara's question, I think we first need to, in the scientific and the academic, well, scientific world as such, you need to agree on this. And only if we then have a full consensus and uh, sound criteria that are generally accepted, then we can think about having regulatory acceptance. But this is not yet for tomorrow, I would say. We are not there yet. So again, here, there is a lot of basic scientific research that is still required. Great. Then uh, I've got one last question from you, and that is uh, from Johannes uh, Schimming. Johannes, go ahead and uh, just uh, speak up. Yeah, uh, I'll use that opportunity to just speak as a person here. Um, in comparison to, uh, for example, the in vitro field in the cosmetics testing, where you have a quiet plethora of different assays for filling more or less the same purpose, I would assume that the hepatic, uh, yeah, that the in vitro world for uh, hepatotoxicity will uh, run a bit similar to that. So I wonder if you have an idea, a set of uh, expectations, which those assays need to be fulfilling of morphological characteristics, metabolic characteristics, transcriptional pattern. Uh, can you envision a set of characteristics which would allow us to identify different assays from different manufacturers? Uh, as a um, equivalent in vitro toxicity model for um, yeah for the future. Yeah, well, again, I'm, I'm not pretty sure if I fully get your question, but 
to compare with the cosmetics field, I mean, we are talking about different types of toxicity. That's more acute toxicity, topical toxicity, while the liver, it's typically systemic toxicity. So we unfortunately don't have any in vitro, uh, at least not fully validated alternative methods available there. Um, if that were to be your question, um, if your question would be like, when can you be pretty sure that your in vitro model is reliable and can be used for toxicity testing? Actually, a couple of years ago, we published on this uh, because it was a question that we very regularly got. Uh, I can refer to that paper. It's published in Archives of Toxicology together with Jan Hengschler, so which is the uh, associate, now the editor in chief of, of uh, Archives of Toxicology. We there came up with a number of phenotypically and functional parameters that should be met by a liver-based in vitro model in order to be pretty sure that it is fully reliable and that you can use it for reliably predicting systemic repeated dose toxicity. But again, I mean, there are of course some commonalities with what is being done in the cosmetics field, but we are talking about very different scenarios. I mean, it's acute toxicity, topical toxicity, while the liver is more systemic toxicity. Yes, of course. Yeah, that answers my question. I'm just, uh, yeah, took the cosmetic field as a good example because we learn a lot with examples which are in use, yeah. especially in, in regulatory context. Thank you. Absolutely. Great. So thank you so much. Uh, thank you also, Johannes, for the question. And I think uh, that, that wraps up this uh, meeting. It's one minute to one. So that uh, I'd like to take that last minute just to thank uh, Mathieu Finken again for, for this great overview <clears throat> and to thank you all for joining. And I hope to see you at the next, uh, the next meeting. Thanks. Thank you, Ninke. And thank you, Elaine, for uh, setting all of this up and for all the logistics support. So thank you, everybody. Bye.